This is CrewCast, a podcast about the most infamous band in rock history, Motley Crew. Your resident crew head, Jason, here. And thank you for listening, my fellow crew head. Of course, available wherever you listen to podcasts. And of course, don't forget, click that link in the podcast description for all the social media. Give CrewCast a follow. Share those stories, everything else, man. I appreciate it. That's how we continue to grow this here podcast. I've got a co-host on this one. I got Brandon from All Damn Night Podcast, one of my favorite podcasts out there. What's going on, brother? Man, how you doing? Thanks for uh, having me on. I know. I'm excited about uh, having you on. We are going to do an album versus album. I am picking Shout at the Devil. You are picking? I am picking Dr. Feel Good. Which we, I thought, oh, it's a little, I was embarrassed to bring that to you. I thought like he's <laughs> going to think this is a little on the nose, but I'm going Dr. Feel Good. That's a dude. We, we all have our favorite albums. And like we were talking before we hit record, ask me on what day. Some days I want to hear Kickstart My Heart and She Goes Down. Other days I want to hear Wild Side and Dancing on Glass. So who knows? And therein lies the beauty of the whole thing, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, the, it's it's never quite. Uh, and if you ask us in 10 years, this might be completely different. But that's kind of like <laughs> gives us a snapshot of where we're at. Yeah, you might go, yes, yeah, son of a bitch. How could you pick that? How could uh, you? What, a, what an idiot I was in 2022. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank goodness they didn't ask us 10 years ago, because then we go, oh, yeah, those guys, those were idiots. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, let's not get into that part. Let's just keep, let's keep it on Motley Crue. Okay. All right. So the rules of this are we each get to argue an album why we think one album is better than the other. We will be able to focus on three tracks and three tracks only. That is it. So you better dig into your knowledge and your love for the crew and those three songs off of Dr. Feelgood and why you're going down that road. I'm a little nervous. I, I can't. I, I mean, I'm on the authority podcast, you know, so uh, <laughs> I'm going to take I'm going to swing for the fences and we're going to get it on, man. Let's do it. Yeah. But for those that don't know, Brandon, Brandon is a very talented musician. He is a uh, you have a degree in history, right? I have a Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, like for whatever that matters these days. <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah. yeah. Dude, I have an in a acting and directing for the camera, which essentially means. I get, I'm qualified to go, hey, would you would you like fries with that? <laughs> but you are qualified to do that. You are qualified. <laughs> Nobody can argue those. That's rock solid. They will not steal that from me. All right. So here we're jumping in. My album, Shout at the Devil. Yours, Dr. Feel Good. I just got to say, I think it's the quintessential album for Motley Crue. Granted, I get it. Never went sure. number one or anything else. But, you know, this is the album that they went out. They toured with Ozzy and they started getting that really big notoriety playing so many different festivals, my friend. Mm -hmm. And and from there, it launched them into the next atmosphere and got their attention. And like I said in the previous episode of Crewcast, while I was talking about my number one album, Shout at the Devil of all time for Motley Crue, it scared the shit out of people. It had the black satin sure. pentagram on the cover. You opened it up. They look scary as hell on the inside. I mean, Mick Mars and Nikki Six just look so freaking gnarly. And there was just something about the way that they went from the first album, Too Fast for Love, where they had that uh, New York Dolls-ish look and really kind of established their first real look, feel, and sound of an album that was so complete in my estimation so that is why i picked shout at the devil and i will argue the songs here in a minute but why are you picking dr feel good well first of all i think that's a very i you know interesting way to put it because it's like they are scary and that's kind of i think a lot of the um in the same vein i think a lot of the tracks off of dr feel good are heavy but not in the vein of like heavy like let's say Metallica, right? For a peer of their time, or let's just go with that. Um, it's in the same vein that like, they are scary, but not really in the same vein that like, uh, like a Slipknot would be, or even okay. like a Black Sabbath would be. Like there's always this kind of underlying, I mean, sexual groove to what they've got going on. It's always there. And I think like, or I think a lot of the kind of, underlying tones in in dr feelgood 
do a great job of kind of skirting that edge, this kind of thing uh, that the Stones did really well. This like right. danger sex thing that they they mix really well. And I think um, in my opinion, I think this is we've, we've talked about this before. Um, I think it's the best Mick Mars album. And mm. I know that's subjective, but I feel like he nobody was playing guitar like that when that album came out at least nobody in that scene and all of those songs i feel like would be completely different certainly if you took any of those pieces out but they'd be unrecognizable if you took uh mick mars's parts out i i will definitely give that to you uh if you are a first time listener crew cast you do not know that uh, i have a huge affinity for mick mars as a guitar player i quite often say my favorite guitar player which is true but you know sometimes stevie ray vaughn jumps in there as well because i'm a big blues guy but uh depends on what day you're asked right? that's, <laughs> right. that's what it boils down to right oh man that's hard for me to argue i mean the, the fact too motley Crue's only number one album which is still a travesty dr feel good but uh I, it is a travesty that she, i i didn't under i didn't know that until listening to the your last podcast which I highly recommend objective opinion, but uh, you know, the number one, number five through one for your top albums that uh, shout at the devil hadn't gone. Number one, I assume that was that had gone number one and just broke yeah. them to the top. Yeah, no, I, yeah, theater of pain didn't go. Number one girls, girls, girls was number two. Uh, I think probably because they still had a lot of that kind of dangerous to danger to them. Right. Although Motley Crue's always had a pop feel, uh, appeal, not feel, but appeal in yeah. in intentionally. I mean, Nikki Six wrote That's about I was that. Say. A genius, I like. Yeah, yeah. like yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, I think very underrated as a songwriter. Um, and what he lays out, uh, it just is brilliant. But anyways, we're sitting here kind of not. Agreed. saying why one's better than the other so yeah so let's right. get to it so i got three tracks i'm going off of uh shout at the devil i'm definitely gonna go well shout at the devil how can you not go the title track i mean it, it, you just it it be has the, yeah <laughs> i'd be remiss thank you for the <laughs> word i was looking for i almost shit the bet on that one i mean to go from in the beginning you know, for me, in my experience, was getting it on vinyl, the cool satin pentagram, opening sure. it up, seeing those images of Mick, uh, Nikki, Tommy, and Vince, just like, whoa, this is gnarly. What is this? And then hearing in the beginning, and when it goes into those first chords of Shout at the Devil, it sets you up for, like, I got chills talking about it. I sure. can remember exactly what I felt when I was that age, Brandon. And Hearing that song, let alone that screaming voice, those big drums in that, you know, I, I can't do Vince Neil, but the shout out the devil, you know, Absolutely. it makes and, me feel it. It makes me remember <laughs> it. Just talking about it. Yeah. The first time I heard it. Right. So it, it's like, how can you argue that as a, let alone an opening track, it's a title track that it just set the feel for what this whole album was going to be. And uh, yeah, still one of the greatest uh, songs in rock, hard rock metal history. So that is one. How can you throw down against that, Brandon? Okay. So my first one that I'm going to throw out there, because I think it is, uh, I think it's, it's uh, Mick Mars most interesting song in my estimation, because he uses, I'm a giant stones fan. And uh, Keith Richards is really known for playing an open G tuning, meaning that they tune the, guitar a different way they tune some of the strings down and that's what uh mick mars does for uh, uh kickstart my heart what he does in the opening riff it's kind of like evocative of like iron man to me it's not it doesn't sound like a kind of maybe pop conscious not not pop oriented but pop conscious uh 80s metal band who's like mm -hmm. well this is our aesthetic and we're trying to write you a catchy song it's like the catchiness of um kickstart my heart is almost kind of like a byproduct byproduct of it it's meant to be an anthem but he takes it from this like it could be this kind of far more poppy far more kind of um maybe you know family friendly version of it and he makes it this gross uh uh super heavy 
kind of psychedelic borderline, definitely of uh, uh, evocative of just heavy metal crashing down from the sky. And they build this whole kind of fast moving, riding a jet plane song out of it. And uh, I think that's the one that points to if you took Mick Mars out of that, that song would be it would be like ne- never being able to take a race car out of like third gear. It just right. he really takes it over the top more than any song, in my opinion, that I that, that was the song that I heard that I was like, who is this? This is this is just uh, I had never heard anything like that before. And when I was asked, like, what's my favorite um, crew album? It was like, well, that just popped up as the first song it's like what album is that on oh yeah dr phil good cool let's go with that yeah and he does uh, in it those uh very cool um they're 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 like blues technique you know a lot of blues yeah, techniques. absolutely that. and he's got a talk box going like at the very end he the the solo is almost entirely different from what he's playing for the it's entirely different it's just like dipping diving almost kind of kind of classical piano thing as opposed to this kind of like keith richards kind of rhythm like it's very like on the beat and then that that solo is at the perfect time he doesn't do it right when you expect it he makes you wait another like measure it's a measure like longer than you think it's going to be sure and then it just take. It's like watching a jet plane take off of the uh, off of an air, aircraft carrier. Like he's going to have to go really fast to do that. <laughs> and he's just like, no problem. Boom. It's <laughs> and it's um, and one of those things as a guitar player, you're like, ooh, well, I can't do that. So uh, it's humbling <laughs> and, and inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm with you. Uh, that makes me want to jump back a little bit to shout at the devil because if you ever hear demo versions of how. Basic isn't the right word because it's it, it, all the chord progressions that the crew uses, especially the early writings that primarily was Nikki Six, were really cool. But then when you layer on loud, rude, aggressive guitar player, yeah. Nick Mars, I mean, we know every Motley Crue fan knows that slogan. They found it in the recycler, you know, loud, rude, right. aggressive guitar player, Mick Mars. It shines through, man. And like, you go back and listen to Shout the Devil. I encourage anyone, crew head listening, Brandon, try to find the demo of Shout at the Devil. And then when you hear that versus the final product and you go, wow, what Mick Mars brought to the songwriting for Motley right. Crue. Holy shit. All right. You know, I mean, it's, we it's know all- the... Go ahead. I, I would say it's, it's almost like uh, they, and that's, you know, the perfect ad, but it's like, they were like more like kiss meets the Rolling Stones in a lot of ways with, with just uh, Vince. If, if you just had Vince, Nikki and Tommy, but then it was like, they got this guy that like, he could have like, if Jerry Cantrell had never played for Alice in Chains, he could have done that. He, yeah. he plays super heavy or if Tony Iommi had gotten the flu and somebody needed to cover for black hat, black Sabbath, he could have done that. Or if Johnny winters needed somebody to play with him, he could have done that. And I think he's the most varied and the most kind of um, like musically cognizant member of the band where he's like, I think the other guys, I think Nikki's a great writer. And then the other guys, want to contribute to that machine and then mick comes in and like is just like screw this i'm taking it all apart and (laughs) throwing it off the tracks and it still goes forward but it's a he's to me the the kind of standout behind all of that i've always been fascinated by him having the guts to to play like that in a in a group where he might not have been allowed to and counter and counter for the times counter for that completely different genre yeah. He's not like running scales. If you listen to him and no, no offense to like CC DeVille, not no offense at all. I think he's sure. CC is a, a great guitar player, but um, boy, like he's not like Mick Mars he's, and they're playing their contemporaries. And you can tell in my opinion, it's like one is the lion and one's the gazelle. You know? <laughs> that was well put. Uh, I and I agree. And again, no offense. I enjoy no. Po- poison music, but uh, sure. all right. So 
We're kissing Mick Mars' ass. We can't yeah, right. that. <laughs> if you're listening, Mick, send uh, autographs to... No. Yeah, right. The sweetest guy on the planet, too, by the way. Um, all right. So my second track that I have to pull, and depending on the day, but quite often, when asked, and I have to state a favorite Motley Crue song, Looks at Kill. Reason mm. being, it's just that cool pedaling riff, so catchy. Vince's vocals are just badass in this. And... Mm-hmm live versions i enjoy more than the album version because nikki was mixed so low on shout at the devil his bass tracks are so low right, right. and it's unfortunate because nikki does some really cool shit on this song if you listen to a live version or you throw some headphones on bring up the bass is because it's got a repeating riff you know almost like an inner sandman yeah. or something that was just that repeating riff over and over until the chorus like and, a John and Lee the, Hooker song. <laughs> exactly. And the bridge. So it kind of gives it that blues bass kind mm-hmm. of vibe too with, with how it's structured and laid out. But in addition to cool lyrics, I, I love Vince Neil. This is one of my favorite vocal songs for Vince Neil. But the way that Nikki Six plays the bass line in it is when it's kind of more the the verse part, he's just pedals the root note a lot. And you'll hear him do the kind of this turnaround walk down. But when it goes into the chorus and it repeats that main riff, he's actually uh, doubling what Mick Mars is playing on the guitar. So it does this, this really cool like vibe to it that maybe people don't catch because that bass is mixed real low. And then just after the solo, you know, where, where Vince does that, uh, or it's that gang kind of, Hey, yeah, uh, yep. you know, it continues mix playing the riff. And then you hear Nikki do like this, that, that, this slide back into the groove. It gives it, I think it's about four bars and he comes back in and then it just brings that song back up again. Like the full thing. It, it, it has so much tension to it. The song he's it's great like, at that. Yeah. It's like, it's building, it's building. All yeah. right. We got this solo, the solo releases the tension. And then right after the solo, we've come back down. It's just the main riff. The drums, are, you know, Tommy, who he's a fucking metronome on the drums. Oh, he, just a machine. Like a, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just a, a total machine. And then it comes back in and then it hears that bass and it just pushes the song out. And I just think it's a brilliantly put together song. It's that cool, what hard rock and metal vibe was at that yeah. time. And I don't know, you know, there's something always about a song about hot bitches. I don't know. I mean, you know, and, and tell me I, I, some, a question for you. Do you think like w- to what, how well versed do you think Nikki is in like old blues? Cause so much of his stuff, I, I know, I, I think he f- sees himself. I think he fashions a lot of his playing off of Keith Richards and Keith Richards is such an old blues fanatic, but it sure. seems like he's really well versed in both this, like, uh, it's like blues basics and this kind of like queen operatic, uh, you know, kind of um, idea of taking a song and making it dip and rise and dip and rise. And it's all very, it's all part of a greater theatrical scheme, not like, not to rip on anybody, but not like the Grateful Dead, where it kind of, it can meander this way and meander that way. Sure. It's all part of a very, um, you know, purposeful theatric uh, whole and and he is really good at doing that without being gratuitous about it i think he's a storyteller um yeah i will do an episode on it i'll want to have you on again you'll have to read uh first 21 his book because he really does talk about nikki six with his songwriting and i'm glad you brought that up brandon um that he has a vision of like a story in his head. You know, you really listen to his lyrics. There's a story. It looks at kill. You know, there's, there's a story there. There really, and it's more than just about a hot ch- chick, but I, sure. to me, I always kind of took it out as it, that a woman really can have a lot of, oh, what's the word? Not control, but, but it is what a vive with, with yeah, what yeah, it yeah. is. And it can be a little bit, um, they can twist it or they can use it. It can be it's an a uniquely feminine attribute. Like we yes. don't really have it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Men, we, we just, we, 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 we don't to that extent. We just don't. Not, not really. So, so I think it's a total, like overall the, the vision and the story that he, that he told. And there's just something about that repeating pattern that's within there, but the variance in the way that it was mixed and recorded that just 
presents this. He, he just had these visions, the, yeah. uh, this overall story. But like you said, influenced by Queen and, you know, um, God, I'm trying to think of some of the other people. He's mentioned Mott the Hoople, um, so many bands. And he even yeah. mentions in his in, in his book about um, Keith Richards when he was when Mickey, Nicky was in his real throes of really bad heroin addiction about like Keith Richards hitting him up and like just kind of BSing with them every once in a while and talking, writing songs. And you can tell uh, he just has this real um, de- he does have a very deep knowledge on on music that goes way back. F- I think people that are Motley Crue, you, you know, detractors think that they're just this kind of mono thematic band that is just like going to play three chords in the same way and try and have like the best time possible. And it's like, they're wrong. They're going to play three chords in a bunch of different ways and have like the best time possible. And it's a real, there's an art form to that. It's like, if you think it's easy, you try to do it. It, right. it is its own thing. And it's um, there. He's really good at it. Yeah, I agree. I think that lended to the longevity of the band for sure. I mean, here we are. We're what, 40 years later now as of Probably this recording. Probably the, the biggest thing, because it's like this, it, it, a band's longevity or at least a band's kind of success, it hinges on their songs largely, yeah. right? And it's like he's, for all of our praise for Mick Mars, Mick Mars is the like cake froster, but like Becky or uh, Nikki Six is the is the the baker, like the guy that actually yeah. bakes everything that's that's a damn good way to put it all right brandon uh song number two for you off dr phil good so kind of a similar theme to what you're talking about and maybe you can fill me in as to how you know actually autobiographical this is but dr phil good like the title songs um i think it's another one that they turn into it's super groovy it could it could have been much lighter than it is just the groove when they were writing it. And then the actual subject matter, I think it's one of the, I know Nikki and I think Mick wrote it, but if I think sure Nikki kind of wrote most of the lyrics, though I'm not a hundred percent on that, but uh, it, it strikes me as like one of the most like um, kind of palpably auto- autobiographical. Cause like, rat tail, Jimmy lives in the street. And it's like, that's yeah. these kind of things that you would have had to, if you've been to LA, you can, especially in the late eighties, early nineties, you know, kind of the guy he's talking about, but oh, yeah. you'd have to kind of be there to get that line. You don't just like sit around and think that up. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. And then Nikki six. So, well, it's uh, the credits show Mick Mars's name first, but I'm assuming that's probably something they laid down together. I would think. And it's, it's creepy in its own way. Cause it's, it's always been, I, I always think I'm um, like listening to hellhound on my trail by Robert Johnson mm. or um, it's kind of in that vein where it's like, this guy is actually in the throes of what he's writing about. Like right. the, he's, he's like just right. And it's not like if you've written that in 2015 then you're a little bit removed from the battle, but it's like, he's just right in the throes of it. And it's not this, like if that had been, a Bob Dylan song, it would be very sad and very right. kind of like uh, <laughs> yeah. droning. And he made it this like really kind of dangerous. It's like, well, no, my life is dangerous. My music is dangerous. And it's um, one of those that like, that was look at the history of gangster rap, like saying anything along the lines of these kind of illicit drugs or opposition to law enforcement or anything was a huge deal in the late eighties, early nineties. It's like passe Mm -hmm. now, but people underestimate like how um, it's not, it wasn't as kitschy as we think it is today. It's like, Oh, there, that was actually like a pretty intense thing to be saying and putting on TV at the time. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, you just think about the music video itself. It plays almost out like a, shortened version of scarface you know exactly another kind of thematically minded thing that they all they even the videos feed into this your kind of memory of the song yeah absolutely Uh, and mick even did some the interesting thing too that we've made the parallel so shout out to devil but it did have the intro of in the beginning prior of course with dr phil good there's tnt terror terror and tinsel town that's just prior so both of those albums title tracks first song essentially but had a cool intro piece that gave a vibe and built it up and both 
come in big, of course, shout out to Devil the Guitars, Dr. Feelgood, that dun, 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 you know, yeah. and that those huge freaking drums that I think Bob Rock producing um, Dr. Feelgood, he was very conscious of that. You know, Tommy is a huge drummer. You watch the guy drum. I mean, and- I've heard so many people say, I just love watching him drum when he's practicing doodle break cymbals and drum heads and all kinds of shit. Did, and I think if if not, man, w- what year was uh, Doctor Phil Good? Eighty seven. Was that uh, no, 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 no. That's ninety one, right? Was it later? I thought. I thought. Yeah. Well, it was eighty nine. Eighty nine. Okay, sorry. I would say it's 91. prior to the it's prior to Metallica's the Black Album because yeah. then Bob Rock went and did. And I, I I think it's like how much did that influence? How much did this album influence the Black Album? Because like mm. it, it, he he. he I think was very used to these big loud drums. Um, they're kind of turning away from Justice for All, and it's like not only did they make a fantastic. So, point being that not only did Motley make a fantastic album, I think they influenced one of the biggest albums of all time as well. It's like how many yeah. people can really say they did that? That's a pretty rarefied air. Yeah. Now, ninety one. I was thinking that was uh, that was the uh, compilation album. Then it came out. Um, uh, un- was it uncensored? I'm drawing a blank. Anyways, I'm glad I wasn't in the wrong decade, though. I was like, I know it's <laughs> late 80s. But... Yeah, no, 89. You nailed it. Uh, but it, that's a very good point that, you know, that it if you think about what then Metallica did following Dr. Feelgood, you know, we got some stuff that had a more of a uh, pop yeah. appeal to it. Right. Wasn't a pop it, song. Still had yeah. some danger to it. You know, Inner Sandman's an uncomfortable song in essence, you know, sure. but uh, brilliant stuff. Of course, Mick Mars is really very cool. easy to listen to. It is. It is. It's it's palpable. It's digestible. That's sure. Uh, to talk about Mick playing on Dr. Feelgood, of course, a lot of cool stuff that he did within the chord progressions, filling out the song. But he also, if you think about the solo, the cool uh, tapping that he did, it's yeah. the only Motley Crue song where he's doing that in a solo. Yeah. So, you know, he did some badass shit. That's for sure. And it's like having a 50 caliber at your disposal and just like using your handgun, like, because <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, he could do that all the time. He could do all this crazy stuff and you just little flashes. He knows when yeah. to use it. You just do a little flash. Cause it, it, it's the same thing as Nikki. It never becomes people can say that this type of music is simple. And it's, you could say the same thing about howling wolf or muddy waters. Right. But they never become gratuitous. You never have yeah. to go like, oh, geez, I'm going to have to like let this guy indulge himself. Like it's all serving the song and it's all it's all uh, it's it's not about glorifying any particular member. They all they always like put a put the song across first. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. All right. My third track, if I got to pull a third one off of Dr. Phil Good. This is tough, man. It is hard. Yeah. The third one was tough for me, too. Uh- all right, I'm going to go 10 seconds to love just because I love the story that's being told and even more so the story behind it. Another cool track that unfortunately on the album bass lines mixed a little bit low. If you hear the live mm-hmm. version, you can hear Nikki does some cool stuff that, you know, in parts he'll, he'll match the lead guitar and then through certain parts, you know, like the solo, he's, he's doing some more pedaling, filling out the song. But I love the story behind it because Nikki Six, he's got, got a story and he's going to talk. And that's one of the things that either you can love about him or hate about him, but he's going to give you his thoughts and opinion. And uh, 10 Seconds to Love, of course, was about seeing how quick he could orgasm <laughs> was a certain chick he wanted to get down to like 10 seconds. Art imitating life, imitating <laughs> art, imitating life. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've never been able to meet that challenge, not at any point in my life. So if Nikki Six pulled that off, hey, he's done a lot of things I never have. That's a stiff challenge, man. <laughs> hey, oh, Brandon. Thank you. Gotcha. Thank you. I'll see y'all. <laughs> I'll be here all week. <laughs> all damn night. That's right. Yes. Uh, but it's just a great song. Another one of those with the lyrics. I mean, I, you know, um, that you just love grab a girlfriend maybe bring two you know uh let me get you in the elevator all these different things that just paint this this total you know you remember the 80s and it was the way the yeah. sexuality was a little bit different there it's still you know more taboo than it is you you know for for guys our age look if you're going to see a boob your dad had to have a playboy yeah, or right, something like right. that we couldn't just sit and google and there it is 
so in, the, in the same vein, it was more fun. It, and I, it was like, you know, oh, yeah. like, not that I remember a lot about sexuality when I was like three, but you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm a little bit older than you. So, but yeah, it, it painted that a certain picture and imagery that every time still that song comes back on that it can, you know, it, it takes you in a fantasy place and it gives you that escapism, which for me, Motley Crue is one of those early bands, as I talked about in the previous episode from personal experience that things that I was going through or whatever it is. Yeah. Recently a hard thing and, you know, put on the, the, but Motley Crue on, we're going for a drive, the family and I, and, and I'm like, you know, all right, 10 seconds to love. I don't know. You know, I got teenagers now, so I'm sure they kind of have a clue, but they might uh, be listening. Right? <laughs> they might be listening to the like, chief death, Molly crew. What the fuck? Uh, but compare that to machine gun Kelly. And I think you'd be all right. <laughs> right? Uh, see, I don't like machine gun Kelly, nothing because of his music, but because he played Tommy Lee and I didn't. And I personally asked Tommy oh, Lee if I, I could play him in that. the dirt movie. This is a true story. You that's, know that story. Yeah, that's true. I didn't even I didn't even I just was trying to think of someone that people might object to their music right off the bat. <laughs> right. That's true. That's that's true. I can vouch for that. Uh, so, yeah, 10 seconds to love. Cool song. Cool groove. Uh, of course, Mick Mars. Again, the early crew stuff, you know, Nikki wrote was a, the writer primarily of every right. song on the first couple albums, but you can hear the brilliance of, of Mick Mars in there, the steadiness of Tommy Lee. And of course, just the screaming vocals or something about yeah. Vince that when you think Motley Crue and his voice, that he, those songs seem to just ooze out of him. It, it yeah. you know, I mean, even the tuning of the guitar and bass were consciously done a full yeah. step down because of the range that Vince Neil can sing in. And at that time, most people were playing maybe what a half step, half, like flat. Yeah. 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 So here's Motley Crue, a full step down. They're a little bit heavier. And it, and it, allowed makes, them, it just makes you inherently heavier. Yeah. And allowed yeah. them some different ranges with the things that they were doing. So my track three, 10 seconds to love. What do you got, Brandon? That was a good. One. Um, so my third, this was a tough one, but I took because um, of my personal kind of penchant and background and uh or pinch I don't, how do you say that this here's america we say pinch it but <laughs> pinch uh, it. uh <laughs> what are you already collecting <laughs> social security no like pinch, a like pinch. an affinity for you know <laughs> right. before, you're, but, um, you're hankering i like it uh, might be apt because i like uh, i grew up on country music i grew up on um uh, you know like old hank williams and yeah. merle haggard and hank snow etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and I always thought that don't go away mad, just go away was like the best country song title that had just been like made. It's like, now nah, we can't use that. Cause that's a, uh, it's, it's, right. it's very evocative of like, I'm left, you're right. She's gone. And like all these very, it's kind of, to me, uh, being, I guess like my history event goes like, well, where did this come from? And then I go, he must have had at some point. Cause it's like, he's clearly listened to all this. Um, Nikki Six specifically, like he clearly yeah. listened to all this rock and roll, and he's listened to psychedelic, and he's listening to blues, and he's listening to jazz, and it's like you little son of a bitch. I think there's some country in there, and it's like yeah, that's that's if nothing else, if nothing but the song title, just the cleverness and the uh, the, the certainly the catchiness. Like all these songs are super catchy, but that was one where it was like kind of like having the temerity to just keeps to say something like that and like right. just, where you're just like well no we're just gonna keep it this simple we're not gonna i'm not gonna try and and be like professor writes a lot and make this like the catchiest song ever it's a great title it's super catchy all the way through and it's to me it was just like the one where i maybe maybe i think poison had a fair amount of country influence and i, I admittedly yeah. just picked this song because of my my influence for that but um i always just thought like don't go away mad just go away that is um uh, just i again i didn't hear anything or i, I don't still don't hear, if you listen listen to the music from that year you don't hear anything like that no. it doesn't sound like anything else that's going on and I think they also with this did a, a good job of like a lot of bands are trying to reinvent themselves 
and and be either like grungier or more like guns and roses and they were just like no we're going to be they just tried to improve and be better and better versions of motley crew and they ended up in the 80s like i think their playing is discernibly more advanced and their writing is more kind of involved than it was in the early 80s and i think that's like a real testament to they could have just kind of you know phoned it in yeah that's a, that's the word i'm <laughs> looking for like a pc way to say that yeah phoned it in and um <laughs> I just thought like, man, just to, to keep every song on this album is, is it's a tough one to pick from. Cause it's like TNT. That's you're absolutely right. No one is making the next time I remember that being done really is like STP. Sure. Like, I, I I'm having a hard time like thinking up that as like a real kind of opening motif. Nobody was really doing that. And that's something you expect from like the grateful dead or something. And right. I'm just like, no, this is like, we're going to open this and get into the groove and then we'll, we'll go from there. And I just think um, w- regardless of which one you pick, you can't say that these guys don't have chutzpah, right? Like they are, <laughs> they are going to do their thing. Yeah. And paint a, paint a cool picture, paint a cool yeah. story, you know? And the great thing about uh, uh, don't go, um, um, this is edit point, Jason. Uh, the great thing too about don't go away mad just go away too if you think about how they kind of wrap up the song again after the solo it's got that really cool push out you know where vince does that and one more time exactly and, and then it, and it and most rock songs you know people you're a songwriter brandon's a very brilliant songwriter hopefully if you got some of your stuff i'm out blushing there, we'll, you guys can't tell i'm blushing we'll throw your link uh, <laughs> of course for the sure. all damn night podcast and maybe some of your music up in the podcast sure. description people can check out but it does that really cool push out and the song actually ends which doesn't happen too much in rock songs because of the it's chord a very, structure. Very ACDC thing to do too. If you listen to like songs like "Ain't No Fun Waiting Around to Be a Millionaire," um, I'm trying to think of like just they're they're the only other ones that will just bring it to where you're like, okay, well, song's over, I'm going home now, and then they're just like, actually, it's not. It's about <laughs> to get way crazier, and then they just bring it all the way back, and it's like that takes a. You're putting a lot you're really it's like crowd diving like you're really jumping and hoping people are going to catch you and keep listening like, <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah that's that's uh i again just love i love it when guys have the 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 audacity to just be like this is what we do you know yeah. f you and this is like how we're going to do it and we're not going to change it just because people love it or lump it Yep. well and so people if you wonder why you're at a rock show and some of the bands in the song and the drummer just you know hitting the cymbals and, and it kind of comes down on the chord as it's the structure of most rock songs. It's hard to bring them to an end. It's hard to, yeah. 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 That's why you yeah. listen to albums thinking shout out the devil. It fades out with Mick kind of playing a cool little lead riff and doing some bends and it just fades out. And you know, the anthem shout, shout, you know, keeps it's, going and you know, it's an interesting thing and they found a way to do it. Dude. I, brilliant song. I'm I don't know if I'm going to win this battle. Well, I, I, to your point, I'm, tell me if I'm wrong here. Real, uh, I've just always thought this about, especially rock music, where it's like, growing up, my dad was a was a bull rider, right? He was a professional bull rider, and I always thought that rock riding, rock, rock playing was just like bull riding because there's no easy way to end the bull ride. You're gonna have to jump off and fall down, and then get up and run away, and like that's kind of there's no you're on this big uh, machine of a rock song that's dipping and diving and you're riding it this way and that way and it's a real delicate art to jump off it and land on your feet it's a tough one yeah i'm with you all right so we, well. we have uh three songs that we've thrown out there the gauntlet is down brandon do you have a final argument for why dr phil good i think that it, pre- it presents more artistic progression from them I think it um, I think it kind of shows their 80s um, kind of lineage and kind of all building up to that. And then they're also trying things that weren't for sure going to work for them. It's easy to say in hindsight that, like, you know, um, kickstart my heart is is awesome but when you first hear it it's so different from a lot of the stuff that was out there it's one of those where you're like man maybe people will really like you know 
jalapeno wrapped in bacon stuff with cream cheese, but maybe they won't. And yeah. you're really like throwing it out there when you first put it on the menu. But I think that it shows, um, yeah, I just think that to have the audacity to keep on, like you said, pushing new creative boundaries and not phoning it in. I think they did a great job to finish out the eighties like that. Well, and I think uh, I'm going to go shout out to devil. My argument, of course, on it is that a, it really put them on the map. It, it brought yep. them into the uh, lexicon of hard rock, heavy metal. It was dangerous. It uh, piqued a lot of interest. I remember, as I told in the podcast, you know, we had to hide that album. You know, we had it was yeah, like there was right, something right. very dangerous. You know, yeah. this was, you know, because I got it when it came out. That's when I was introduced to Shout Out the Devil was my introduction to Motley Crue. So there's like that danger that was there and present about the band and that there was something also very counterculture at the same time there was and, yeah. and so for me it, it just the embodiment of what it represented and where it launched the career of motley crew and people taking them serious going from just this la band to this global thing then at that point and when they started to get out there and the songs were present they were present right. there was a there was a blueprint and a mindset that nikki six had you know being in london prior to that and working with blackie lawless and all these oh, yeah, you yeah, know yeah. It, it it was it was the first too fast for love is great but shout out the devil was the first full package of here is yeah. motley fucking crew and here's what it is and take it or leave it doesn't matter because we're going to leave a huge scar on the face of rock and roll and they did and they sure so did. i don't know uh, we'll just leave. You may have poll. swayed me, my friend. You may have swayed me. <laughs> well, I think you swayed me when I started. Well, we're, we're now at the end of this. We've come full circle to each other's position. Uh, hey, if you are listening, crew head, make sure that uh, if you're on Spotify, there is a poll there. And uh, who won? Is it Dr. Feelgood? Is it shout out to devil? Leave a vote, vote there. We'll talk about it on the next crew cast and see. Uh, who liked what better? It's uh, just that I simple or what the love argument. That, that. I wish more, I do wish more platforms would do that. I love that question yeah. and answer. Yeah. That's, that's a great deal to be able to interact with people like that. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Well, Brandon, if people want to check out uh, all damn night and all your stuff, uh, tell them a little more about it. Sure. Yeah. We're, um, we're really now more of a network. We've got a lot of different shows, but all damn night is a music history podcast. So if you like music, we just, talk about uh, how music got to where it is and um, intertwine history with it. Um, so think you'd like it. If you like this show, check out all damn night. It's on all, you know, the, the streaming platforms on iTunes and Spotify and Stitcher and all that stuff. And then uh, check us out online. We have lots of uh, all, all of our kind of bonus stuff and we have subscription options um, for posting a lot of this kind of more in-depth shows that we're doing. Um, so you might like that. Check it out at all damn night dot com and if you want to check us out on instagram which i'm doing a better job of posting on <laughs> uh, it's uh, instagram.com slash all damn night network well there you go and uh, the link is in the podcast description brandon and uh hey i love you brother thanks for jumping on crew likewise man. man thank you for having me enjoyed it yeah hell yeah i will we'll have to come back or make it the regular thing can't wait man can't wait and all right my fellow crew head crew heads are best fuck the rest <laughs>